So we're going to do something a little bit different here this morning. I wanted to, I wanted to throughout this year, try to give a couple opportunities for us to hear, um, for us to hear how the Lord is working through several, I don't know, just folks in our church. Um, and I had this, I had this desire during the kind of the winter break, I was thinking about this and I was thinking this would be really good because sometimes I feel like I get to talk to people and hear how the Lord is working in lives, um, but sometimes we don't have good opportunities to share that. And right, right as I was thinking about that, I had a conversation with somebody and I thought this would be a great person to start with. Um, so I'm going to invite Colleen Fisk. Could you come up and join me up here on the stage? And you should give her a hand. Colleen, we're just going to sit down here for a minute and visit. I love it. Yeah, it's going to be like interview style. <laughs> I didn't make a, I should have made like a music for you to come down to. Like <laughs> Price is right. Exactly. Um, this is Colleen, and I'm Jesse. Hey. And um, if, in case you don't know, uh, or even if you do, Colleen has been for a little over a year, maybe two years now, I'm not sure, um, but in charge, one of the people in charge of our children's ministry here at our church, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and I wanted to have a chance here to have a conversation with her because I get to hear Colleen about what's going on a lot of times back there from you, but I thought it would be good a chance for us to visit together about that. So the first question, that everybody wants to know the answer to, Colleen, um, is whose kids are the best? Oh. <laughs> wow. That's a tricky uh, one. <laughs> all right. That's all the time we have today. <laughs> <Right>. uh, <laughs> okay. So uh, we have just a couple things that I thought maybe we, uh, I have like some, some questions I thought I have yep. written here um, that might help us hear a little bit more about how God got you into this position and, and what he's doing through you. The first one was like, I, I'm genuinely curious, have you, have you always wanted to work in children's ministry, like ever since you can remember, like, oh, I can't wait to do Sunday school or babysit or, or whatever, um, that never happens back it, there. Have you always wanted to do that or is this pretty new? It, it's, it's a great question. I've always had um, uh, enjoyment of of being with children. And so that's definitely something that ever since I was a child, I've enjoyed working with children. Um, but actually when Tony and I first started coming to Daybreak back in 2010, we knew we wanted to get involved, but we were new. We didn't really know what ministries were going on or what was needed. Um, and they said, oh, our kid zone, um, which was back in what is now the kitchen, <laughs> uh, needed teachers. And so together, the two of us were like, okay, we'll serve together and we'll teach. It, I think it was first through fifth grade at that time. Um, and it was a lot of children who are now in college and have outgrown <laughs> Daybreak and are doing other things. But it was such an exciting time to be able to, to one, get to know other people in the church. Because when you get to know the kids, you get to know the parents. And so it was a great opportunity for us to just do that. And we've just since done children's ministry in a variety of ways so it was more it was more just being you were available and and that just came up I loved what Mary said about God can use you even when you don't feel fully equipped yeah. if you're there and willing to be used he will use you in whatever capacity is needed so let's talk a little bit more specifically what you said you love working with kids and stuff but what would you say are maybe one or two of your favorite things when you're when you have the chance to be back there teaching and I know you don't always do that but when you have the chance to be back there teaching what are some of the things you love in particular about about that time I love that our children are so hungry to learn about God if you've ever worked with any of these young kids they really do want to know and being able to see them act out Bible stories or being able to see them share scripture that maybe doesn't mean a whole lot to them right now but maybe when they're in college or when they're grown themselves, it's going to be a verse that's going to come back to heart. And to know that you've been able to be a part of that, to really develop the next generation. Like, we will all be gone at one point. These children in our church is the ones who are going to be continuing Daybreak on. And to be a part of what growing that next generation, it's really, really exciting. That, 
I love that too. And being from the, like, the other side of it, kind of witnessing some of the investment that teachers have made in like my kids hearing Bible stories or like even some of the questions that have just come up and I don't always handle them perfectly. Usually it's like, let's talk about it later. <laughs> um, but, but hearing some of that, I just re I'm really grateful for that. And I would agree, like we have a lot of kids in our church who are hungry for God's word. And I think that's, that's incredible. Yeah. Um, let's we'll, we'll wrap it up here. But yeah. um, I know there's a lot of things going on. I mean, I can, I can tell just when I'm sitting up here and I ask kids to come up here and there's like, they're like filling the aisles and like there's like standing room only and stuff. I know there's a lot going on in the children's program. Can you share like some of the dreams or the plans you have for the upcoming year with us? What's, what's coming up? What are we doing? Yeah, well, as you mentioned, Jesse, it, I'm sure you all can tell we have had such an influx of children in our church recently, which is so exciting. Um, but with that, we realized we need to continue to adapt our children's program. And so one of the big steps, and you've seen the announcement um, in the bulletin and then in the weekly email, is that we're going to be opening up a fifth classroom. Um, and so that's really exciting for us to be able to start developing like extra classrooms, more space for the kids. Some of these classrooms have gotten huge, so this will help our teachers too. So we're really excited about that. Um, and I don't know if if I'm okay to, to make a little bit of a, a plea, if, if you've ever been interested in, in teaching, you don't have to be fully equipped. You don't have to have taught children in the past. We are just looking for people who are willing to serve. Um, and we can fill you in in a variety of age groups, whatever that looks like. And we're even going to be starting to continue to develop like our children's ministry leadership. And so even if working with kids isn't what's on your heart, but you're willing to serve in another capacity, please do come see myself or Emily Bergeron. We'd be more than happy to chat with you about what opportunities are out there. Um, again, we're just here trying to, to train up this next, next group of daybreakers, and it's, it's a lot of fun. We have a really good time. I can, I'll, just, I'll just kind of dovetail with what you said, because I, I've only gotten to go back there uh, during some, the Sunday school hour once. Um, and uh, it just happened to be a time when like, I didn't have to be here, and so I'm like, I'm gonna go back there, and I helped, I, assist, I s assisted somebody teaching, um, but I'll just say to you guys, like, not my training, not, not my gifting, I had no, like, zero experience going back there, um, but I was able to just walk in and like, hang out with children and listen to the lesson and participate in that, um, and it was just a really, like, I would agree. Um, I, I learned a lot of stuff doing that because one of the best ways to learn is, is not just to listen but to teach and to interact with the material so um, I can just interact I, I um, affirm that it's something where you can kind of step in and it can be intimidating for sure uh, but God will use you um, if you say yes to him so e either in this area or some other so yeah right. and Good even fun. finding somebody who you wouldn't mind working with you know we've got a lot of partner teachers who have a lot of fun whether that's a spouse or just somebody who they've come close to in the church it's great to be able to together partner and, and do life in this with someone by your side. Great, thank you so much, Colleen. Yeah, Can thank you. Guys you. Give her a hand? <laughs> so now turn it over to the guy who knows what's actually going on during announcements time. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm now lost here. So Tony, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay. Thanks. That's a bold and probably untrue claim. But thank you. I appreciate that. I'm just going to steal my podium back here. All right. So I'm going to keep it short and sweet, guys. Um, just a couple of things I want to draw your attention to. Um, children's ministry that we just heard from is birth through third grade today. So please register your children in the back if you haven't already. We'd, we'd love to have them if they're new or visiting or a regular attender. You can sign them in at the table in the back. Um, all of the children's ministry changes that are sort of tentative right now, and there's going to be some more information coming. Mm -hmm. If you have children and, and you want to know the details, it's on the back of your bulletin here of sort of what our plans are. Yep. Um, and also, if you're looking to volunteer, this is kind of what's going on with that uh, in a nutshell here on the back of your bulletin. Um, also, there's a few save the dates at the bottom as well. We have an agape worship night and a congregational meeting coming up in February. That is our annual meeting. Um, so just pencil those in on your calendar if you would. Um, and I'm not going to stay up here that long because I really don't know what's going on most of the time. I just pretend and I read off this. So, all right. So if you would take a moment and let's fill out this communication line. You should each have one in your bulletin. And the ushers are going to come around during our time of offering momentarily. 
Uh, and you could put that in there. This is, this is so that we can be praying for you. So if you have something on your heart, on your mind, a trial, a praise, anything that you want our prayer team to pray on your behalf for, we'd love to have that. So write that on your communication line and put it in the basket as it comes around. And again, if you are new, you've heard me say this a lot, but maybe if you're new, you haven't. Please don't feel compelled to give during our time of offering. Uh, we're just glad you're here. Um, so thank you for being here. And now let's pray. If you would join me, please. Father, we are grateful to be able to sing uh, praises to you, to be able to lift you up and put you at your rightful place as ruler of the universe, as Lord of our hearts, and to, to just give you the honor and glory and, and, and everything that you deserve this morning, Father. It's, it's where we are most uh, in the place that we, we uh, feel the best, Father, is when we put you in your rightful place, Father. It's, it's how it's meant to be. And, and as we sang this morning, um, you make giants fall and you shake prison walls, Father. If there are any prison walls or giants in our life, they're not giants or prison walls to you. They're insignificant to you, Father, even though they're significant to us. And, and we just uh, give you all those things that we, we hold on to that maybe loom large in our life. Uh, I just pray that we would trust you. That's a hard thing to do, Father, but we, we, we just give it to you, Father. We pray that you would make yourself known in our lives, that you would show us that you are, in fact, in control, even in our own lives. Um, even the things we feel that we can't. So give us that heavenly perspective that you have, Father, that eternal perspective. And we pray all of this and give this time to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Does life hit you so hard that you've been knocked down? Have you gone too far to find the middle ground? They raise you so high just to pull you back down Have you been so lost you could never be found? Cause I've been real, I've been fake Been a sinner, I've been a saint I've been right, I've been so, so wrong Yeah, I've made my mistakes I don't know what it's like to be you Those who want to come join me up here for a few minutes, come on up. What do you have? Yes. Is that a Bible? Oh, Sam, that's so cool. Hi, you guys. All right, you're going to want to be able to see the screen today because I got a game to play with you guys. Yay. Yeah, I know. I'm excited about it, too. You don't even know. How you guys doing? Did you see all the snow out there? Yeah. Yeah. You got two gumball machines? Yeah. What can you do with two gumball machines that you can't do with one? Double bubble. Oh, that's my girl. That was good. Got you, man. High five, girl. Good job. Good job. Well, I got, I got two shoes for Christmas, a right one and a left one. Yay! Okay. All right. Sorry. We should we should move along here because, because I have a game for you guys. Uh, do we have do we have this game, Jason? Yeah. I'm call I'm calling this game Yikes. I call it Yikes. What do you think of that? 
Are you prepared for this? I don't know if you guys are ready for this. Hadley, if you get scared, you might need to hold Melanie's hand because you might get scared. Okay, I'm, I'm going to ask you guys to help me with this because I, we need to make some decisions here. You're going to see you're going to see two pictures, and you need to tell me which one is scarier. Okay, okay. So I'm going to ask you if it's one or two, and if you think it's one, you raise your hand. If you think it's two, you you put up a two. Okay, put up one, put up a two. All right. Are you ready? Are you? Are you You fear nothing. Oh, we'll see if we're going to try to fix that. Okay, are you ready? All right, here's the first one. Bang. All right. If it's, if you're, if it's a one, hold up a one. If two, hold up a two. Which one's scarier? A t uh, spider or a T-Rex? Seth isn't scared of zero of them. Ollie's not scared of any of them. Melanie, you say a T-Rex? I think that's a good choice. A spider? Yeah. Spider over T Rex, couple T Rexes over there. Spider, yeah. I think T Rex might have this round. Okay. All right. Number number two, round number two, bang. One is being falling from really high, and the other one is chores. The, this is actually this is actually Abby's list of chores. Mow the lawn, walk the dog, and cut grandma's toenails. Those are Abby's choices. Chores. <laughs> Which one is scarier, falling from really high or doing chores? Two, two. I think I think we got two, a couple of twos over here. Okay. Uh, falling from really high. I couldn't. I was like fair at heights. It was I was trying to get to. Are you scared of heights? I'm pretty scared of heights too. No. You're not scared of heights. You're Oh, you all heard it here. Ollie is okay with chores. So it's on, it's recorded on Facebook right now, Ollie. It's and you go to heaven. It's, it's good. Nothing to be afraid of. Oh. Fun. Which one was scary? The snake? <laughs> we got a couple scared of all of it. Yeah, yeah. Juliet, you're scared. Which one's two? The shark. I'm scared of sharks too. You're scared of all of them. Snakes, sharks. All oh, he's not scared of anything. Both. Well, you guys better be ready. The scariest one of all is coming up last. If you're not scared of anything, you're gonna be scared of this. Ready? Go. Is anybody scared of anything on this picture? This is a puppy dog. And really, that's actually kind of another puppy dog. That's Pastor Brent with his serious face on. All right. Hopefully, you're not scared of either of those. Not scared of any of those. Yeah, yeah, that's probably good. That's probably good. Here's, um, so thanks for playing Yikes with me. Um, here's, this was on my mind this week, um, and I'm not sure why, but I have, this, I have this scripture up here that I thought maybe somebody would like to read. Does somebody want to read for me? Seth, Seth you want to read? Can you read, that? Can you read that there? Even when I go through the darkest valley, I feel... I fear no danger, for you are with me. Come on, preach, boy. That was good. For you are with me. Well, the next part is, well, you, why don't you read the psalm part? Can you read the psalm? You see the part that says psalms? Right there in the middle? It's a hard word. It starts with a P. That's it exactly. High five. Good job. You know, you know what the Bible says. 
Hey, guys, listen up. Ali, come here. Listen. As the Bible says so much about not being afraid. So often in the Bible, God says, you don't have to be afraid. And why does he say we don't have to be afraid? Do you see it here? Why, why do we not have to be afraid? Because God, he says, that's his promise. He says, you don't have to be afraid because he says, I am with you. So no matter what situation, just like said, God, if God is have anything to be afraid of, I think this mic's trying to make me stop, so I'm going to stop. But thank you guys for playing this game with me. Thanks for helping me face my fears. Why don't we pray together, and then you go back to your classrooms? Yeah? yeah? Okay, let's pray. Let's put Oh, good job. Let's put our hands together, if you can join me. I'm just going to pray right now. So, dear God, thank you for this time. Thank you, God, that we, we can face our fears knowing that you have us, that you do not abandon us. And, Lord, I pray for all of us in this room today. I pray for us across the, the building that you would speak to us, that you would speak, that you would bless us God, this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you all. Well, good morning. Good morning. So while it's uh, tempting to take the next half hour to exact my vengeance on Jesse, we're going to actually go into the Bible this morning. So if you have your Bibles this morning, am I, is my mic on? Darcy? All right. Can you guys hear me now? All right. So if you have your Bibles this morning and want to find your way to Proverbs chapter 3, your Bible or devices in Proverbs chapter 3, we're going to Take our break from our sermon series, Love Vermont, this week. Jesse's giving me his blessing to, to step back uh, and just do uh, a scripture outside of the sermon series in Matthew 13. Um, just because this past, end of this past year, I, I don't even remember honestly how this happened. I landed in Proverbs 3 and spent probably the last six weeks of the year just reading that and studying that every day and wanted to just share with you from the Lord. Uh, with the lessons I've learned, at least from Proverbs chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles, find your way to Proverbs 3. As is our custom, if you're able, will you please stand out of reverence for God's word? We're going to read Proverbs 3. We're going to read verses 1 through 18. This is God's word, which says, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments for length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Heard that before? That's, uh, that's what you call a word from the Lord right there. But just FYI, Mary and I didn't talk this morning. She had no idea what my scripture was this morning. But let's read that again. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and, you, and with your first fruits, all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son, in whom he delights. And what's going to happen if we do all those things that we just read? Well, you're going to be blessed. Verse 13, blessed, happy. Happy is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than gain from silver and profit better than gold. She, being wisdom, is more precious than jewels, and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand, and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. And what is wisdom? Verse 18. I entitled the message this morning, Wisdom is a, 
a, a happy life. It says, she is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. A happy and blessed life. Let's pray together. Father, we ask for that. We ask that uh, through your spirit and by your mercy that we would live lives that are happy and blessed because they're living for you, because they're wise lives. And so I pray, Lord, that by your spirit, through your word this morning, that we might learn that better, experience that better, that we might experience the personification of wisdom, which is Jesus Christ the person of Jesus. Lord, help us to be wise. Help us to learn wisdom this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. So I think we'd all agree there's a lot of knowledge in the world, a lot of information, especially in the world, but probably not a lot of wisdom. Uh, A fascinating fact, and maybe you've heard this fact before, but until about 2000, before the Uh, information age hit, the age of the internet most specifically, um, that it's estimated we have about, we had about five exabytes of information in the world since the dawn of human history. Five exabytes, that's five billion gigabytes if you put it in computer standards, of information in the world. That was the total amount of information. But then obviously the information age hit And they estimate that we get new information, about five exabytes of human information, new media, new information, every two days. So that is is mind-boggling to think about until the year 2000. That was sort of all of uh, information in human history, and then it's just changing at a dramatic dramatic rate. And now with AI, it's maybe even faster uh, than that. Lots of knowledge, lots of information, but not lots of wisdom. Not lots of wisdom. And I think that's what Solomon, who the Bible says was given the gift of wisdom, is unpacking for us here this morning. And he's doing it in a very personal way. You you might know that Proverbs is a a, a book of wisdom. It's Solomon's gift of wisdom. Wisdom, The Bible says he wrote about 3,000 Proverbs. We have 31 chapters of them in our Bibles. That means you can read one a day. One proverb a day keeps the, keeps the devil away. I mean, that, it's uh, 31 of them. You could read one every day of the month. But their, their, their wisdom that Solomon wants to download into his son's life, and we're lucky to listen in because that's the way God wanted it to be, and he gave us these, these bits of wisdom for us to live our lives. And so he, here's what I've summed them up to be, six characteristics of a wise and happy life that I want us to consider this morning. So here they are. Uh, uh, Number one is obedience. Number two is kindness or loving kindness, as it translated. And here's a word you've heard this morning. Again, uh, this wasn't, we didn't collaborate to get this word, but a a word that we've heard this morning already, trust. A third characteristic of a wise and happy life is a life of trust in God. Uh, Number four is fear. Fear of God. Number five is giving. And number six is a church word you don't hear many times used outside of church is repenting. Repenting. So let's let's think about those characteristics of a wise and happy life for us this year, but for every day of our life. Uh, number one, the characteristic of obedience. Let me just repeat again uh, verses one and two where this is spelled out. Is, you know, Solomon, again, speaking to his son, <clears throat> says this, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart do what? Keep my commandments. And what happens when you do that for length of days, but not just a long life, the principle of a long life, not necessarily a promise, but a principle of long life, uh, you'll have years of life. Not just a long life, but a good life, years of life. And what kind of life and what will be an attribute of that life? And peace. They will add to you. So you want to live a life not just of many years, but many years of a life and a life that's characterized by by peace, then your life needs to be characterized by following the commandments that you've been given. And, you know, that's a little bit of a debate. It's kind of hard to uh, definitely stay here. You know, some people say, was, was Solomon trying to say, 
the things that I've taught you as a son growing up, uh, most people believe Proverbs is, again, the personification of wisdom. And so Solomon, when he says, obey my commandments, he was talking about the commandments of God and all the, all the ways that he's let his life be characterized by obedience to God. Uh, but I was thinking, even if it was just the things that Solomon taught his kid, those were probably good things that uh, he should do. I was thinking about the things my mother taught me. You know, what, what, your, your mother probably taught you these things too. Brush your teeth. I mean, I wouldn't be married if I didn't brush my teeth. Uh, eat your vegetables. Uh, I don't eat as many as I should, but I've made it 50-something years because I've eaten healthy enough. Uh, buckle your seatbelt. Go the speed limit. Of a memory, childhood that memory came to me as I remember when everybody was jumping off a tree into the river uh, by where I lived as a little kid. Uh, I remember my mother said, no, you're not jumping off a tree into the river. And I remember one kid got seriously hurt because he couldn't see what was under, underneath the tree. So the, the principles of you just listening to your parents and honoring your parents, um, you know, I think it could be that. But I think, again, it's more the personification of wisdom and the commandments of God that Solomon was trying to instill in his son. It's like, listen. You want to live a good life, a life of peace, length of days, and life of, uh, and life and peace, and then you live a life of obeying God. You live a life of obeying God. You know, and, and I, I think it's important to understand that, that that's not a power trip for God, where he's saying, obey me. That, that's a peace trip. He has your best interest in mind. He loves you. Jesus said, I come that you might have life, and you might have it, might more, might have it more abundantly, but if you want to experience that life, it's characterized by knowing God's word and by obeying God's word. And so let me be crystal clear. I'm not saying this morning that you have to obey enough so that you become a Christian. You have to obey enough so that you go to heaven. Jesus came because we can't obey enough. Jesus came because we don't obey enough. Jesus came so that he would die for our disobedience. And by our faith in him, we have a personal relationship with God. We don't obey enough to get accepted by God. We get accepted by God because of our faith in Christ, and therefore we want to obey him. And, and that's the gospel, and that's how it works. But listen, God, uh, God will bless your obedience to him. And, and Solomon wanted his son to understand that. I can remember the first time this crystallized in my mind. I was in a lecture by one of my favorite professors, uh, Dr. Bill Toller, uh, and he was just talking about, I think he was talking about the Ten Commandments being displayed in the public sphere and how they were trying to take that down. And he, he said something sarcastic, but it, for some reason it really struck me. He goes, well, what would happen in society if we just stopped, dis, if we just decided to do the opposite of the Ten Commandments? Think, think about what America would look like if we just said, everybody, dishonor your mother and father. Everybody kill. Everybody commit adultery. Everybody steal. Everybody lie. Everybody covet. And I was like, well, that's true. Wouldn't, wouldn't look too pretty here in our world, would it? God always has your best interest in mind. God always has love for you in mind. And that's what Solomon was trying to say to his son here what the Bible is trying to say to us, you know, you know, God would rather be blessing and favoring us than forgiving and restoring us. That, that's the way he's, he set life in motion. Let me take a, the lead from Solomon here. Let me just ask, if you don't mind, if you're, if you're under 20 years old, would you just raise your hand? I know I'm going to put some people on the spot. Dwayne, Dwayne, put your hand down. If you're, if you're under 20, under 20, under 20, if you would just raise your hand. Yeah, a bunch of liars in the room. <laughs> but, but, but I think Solomon was older, obviously, but he's looking back at the people that were under 20. And I, and I hope you hear me. I became a Christian when I was 20 years old. And I wish I could take back some of the stupid things I did. Anybody understand what I'm saying? Any older people want to understand what I'm saying? I, I'm 50-something years old and still have some consequences for that. God has your best interests in mind. Live for him, love him, obey him. 
He, he doesn't have a power trip. He has a love trip. He has a peace trip. He has your best interest in mind. If you want to live a wise life, you want to hit, live a happy life, then you live a life of obedience to him. A second characteristic is what I've called loving kindness, what many of the translations say, verses 3 and 4. If you could bring those up, Jason. He, he says, Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of the heart. In other words, let that be the attributes of your life. When someone looks at you, they say, that's a person of love and faithfulness. And what happens when you live a life like that? You're going to find favor and good success in the sight of God and in the sight of man. You know, there's a little bit of difficulty translating that. Uh, verse 3, some translations say, let mercy and truth. Some of them just say, uh, love and loving kindness. Um, and some people think that maybe it's better translated mercy and truth. And I wouldn't argue with that because that's what Jesus was like. The Bible says that Jesus came full of grace, love, and truth. And some people think, well, maybe the Solomon's trying to say that we need to balance that. We need to leave, live lives in our speech and our actions that are full of truth and love. And Jesus was the only one that ever did that right. Remember, you know, his interactions with the Samaritan woman, uh, he confronted her about uh, the fact that she wasn't worshiping God appropriately, but that at the same time, he offered her rivers of living water inside her. Remember the woman that was caught in act of, of adultery? He says, I don't condemn you. I don't condemn you. But at the same time, go and sin no more. Jesus, when he uh, interacted with Nicodemus, he says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. But at the same time, he said, he who doesn't believe in the Son, God's wrath remains upon him. Jesus always balanced grace and truth. And so some people think, well, maybe that was Solomon was getting at. I think maybe a better idea is uh, Solomon was just trying to get at the point of living a merciful and a kind and a loyal type of love life. In other words, you know, let, let your life be characterized by kindness, by not just, you know, warm and fuzzy kindness, but, but true concern about other people. I mean, we live in an epidemic of rudeness. I'm so glad I don't have a customer service job. I mean, we, it's COVID. People lost their mind and haven't recovered when it comes to a, a customer service, just simple manners and kindness towards people. And I think, I think Solomon was making an observation. Obviously, it's a proverb. It's life experiences. He was trying to tell his children and is that, you know, success in life sometimes is just from being a genuinely kind, caring person. When you look at people, you look at that other person, you say, this person was made in the image of God. Whether they're a jerk or not. Jesus died for this person that I'm interacting with and locking eyes with. And I, I would say uh, life, my life has bared out that experience. Sometimes success in life is just from being a genuine, from genuine kindness. Sincerely looking at other people as they were made in the image of God. You know, the great theologian of my day, Mr. Rogers, said this. Here, here are three ways to ultimate success. The first way is to be kind. The second way is to be kind. The third way is to be kind. I just had my 30th evaluation as a, in, in my other career as a, as a nurse, and uh, I'm, I'm still employed. I did well. <laughs> but I, I was thinking about it, but a, a lot of the success I've experienced in my other career is, I think, just because I've tried to be kind. I, I mean... I, I don't have an intellect that's like way better than other people. I don't have a knowledge base that's way different than other people. But there, there, there's a sense of success and favor that comes in the sight of God and in the sight of man when you have a life that's characterized by genuinely caring about people. Helen Keller said that uh, the world has, this was a while back obviously, but she said modern science has found a cure for most of the uh, evils of the world, 
but it hasn't found a cure for the worst evil of all, the apathy of human beings. She was blind and deaf, but she could see and hear enough to know that people don't care about people the way that they should care about people. And Solomon's saying the same thing. Let, let loving kindness be, be the attribute of your life. And maybe especially to the people that you love. Because sometimes those are the people that we're the rudest to. So we're to, to live lives of loving kindness. A, a third one, and again, a word from the Lord today, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust, a third characteristic. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and what's going to happen, he will make your path straight. That, that word trust means to cling to, as I heard, uh, or as I read, I should say, one commentary said, to, to hold on for dear life. That, that's the kind of trust that it's talking about. It reminded me of a story, not one of my favorite stories, but one of my wife's favorite stories of when we were on our honeymoon. We took a cruise, and we did an excursion of going snorkeling. And so we were off the boat. We got on another boat, and they took us out into the Caribbean. And uh, most of you aren't going to be able to relate to this story, because, but if you know me, you know I have a, very, I'm, I have a real aversion to cold. But so that we're in the Caribbean in March, so you would think I'd be okay. We we go out into uh, miles into the ocean, and uh, the first red flag was our guide. Literally, she was I had to be 13 or 14 years old, and, and then the second red flag is she put on a wetsuit, and then she jumped in the water and she said, "Okay, everybody, join me." And so I'm like, "Okay," I jumped in the water. It felt like Lake Champlain. And I know that's not a big deal to you guys, like 70-something degrees. I couldn't breathe. I, it took my breath away, and I couldn't catch my breath. And I'm like, great, I'm going to die on my honeymoon. No kidding. So panic attack sets in. I swim over about 10 feet away to the boat anchor, and I'm holding on. And everybody's staring at me. And my wife was acting like she didn't know me at that point. <laughs> and uh, the, the 12-year-old young lady comes over and swims to me. She goes, let me get you and pull you back into the boat. And I said to her, I will die before you drag me back into the boat. And I said, give me a minute. I'll eventually start breathing again. And, and, and I did, but it, it took me a few few minutes. And so... Uh, I mentioned that story because I was clinging to that boat anchor for dear life. So in that sense, it's a good example of what it means to trust in the Lord. But actually, it's a horrible example. And what I mean by that is I was clinging to an anchor. I had something to hold on to. I was, if you will, leaning on my own understanding. I think a better analogy, a better illustration is let's suppose I went out on that excursion and the guide said to me, jump out into the water. But by the way, I'm going to take the boat. I'm going to head back to shore. And I'm going to be like, well, what am I supposed to hold on to if the water's too cold? Or when are you going to come back and get me? Or do you have any plans to come back and get me? No, we don't have any plans. And I'm being a little sarcastic, but I'm being very serious. That's what trust in the Lord looks like. You, you, you've got nothing to hold on. If he fails, you fail. So your only, your only hope for this excursion called life is to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. If he fails, you fail, but God won't fail. And that's the excursion of life. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. And then that's when you find God's will for your life. God's will for your life is a blank contract. You say, here I, the understanding, Brent Divinity, will follow Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. And here's what I agree to do. Nothing. I just sign the bottom. That's the way it is with the Lord. Trust in the Lord all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. 
In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. So we, we want to live a, a wise life, a happy life. Uh, we, we trust in the Lord. A fourth attribute, characteristic of a, a, of a wise uh, life, a happy life, is fear. Fear, listen to verse 7 and 8. Be not wise in your own eyes. Instead, do what? Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. And what will happen? It will be healing to your flesh, refreshment to your bones. If you've read the book of Proverbs, you know it does a lot of contrasting of the the fear of the Lord versus the fear of man. Or the fear of the Lord, or fear of circumstances. And and so the take-home message of the book of Proverbs is, you only need to have one fear. And it will take care of all your other fears. And that's the fear of the Lord. That's the fear of missing out on the Lord's will for your life. And then it sort of takes care of that fear of circumstances. It sort of takes care of that uh, fear of man or fear of other people's opinion. We're only to have one fear. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. You want a wise life? You want a happy life? You, you, You fear the Lord. And he alludes to two ways that that works here in this verse. If you're Uh, Going to fear the Lord, you're going to not be wise in your own eyes, and you're going to turn away from evil. The the key to be a wise wise person is to realize you're not wise. You need the Lord. Uh, The the key to uh, being a wise person is to to turn away from evil. You, you You have such a fear in your life of disappointing the Lord and not experiencing His will for your life that that you turn away from evil. You don't want that to to be how you handle a situation or what characterizes your life. You know, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You know, me and my, my wife uh, debate a little bit about, she doesn't like the way I, when I say that in some ways there's a way of being scared in a healthy way of the Lord. She prefers that I don't say that you should be scared of the Lord because I, I realize because some people, they are scared of the Lord in an unhealthy kind of way. Uh, perhaps the best definition I ever came across was one by a pastor that I listen to frequently, but this is his definition of the concept of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the reverential awe, and this is important, based on a relationship, not repercussion, that will produce a humble submission to a loving God. And, you know, I don't know, that, that just doesn't do enough for me, the reverential awe. I mean, and there's some sense where I am scared of the Lord, but not in a bad way, in a, in a healthy way. Like, I don't want to miss out on his will. I don't want to experience his discipline. I, I don't want to disappoint him. You know, not in the sense of he's going to zap me or going to send me to hell because Christ has paid the price for my, my sins. But I want, to, I want to love him and I want to live for him. And, and I don't know how else to describe that. It's a hard concept to describe. The fear of the Lord. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's what helps us to turn away from sin in our life. It's what helps us uh, to be humble, to not be wise in our own eyes. So we want to live a, a, a life that has some fear to it. A couple more, and I'll try to go through these uh, quickly here. Uh, a fifth characteristic is to, to live a giving life. Listen again to verse 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will be bursting with wine. I I think you've noticed the pattern here now. If you do something, something's going to happen. If you honor the Lord with your wealth, and with the first fruits of your produce, your tithe, if you will, then your barns will be filled with plenty. God's going to take care of you. And, And your vats will be bursting with wine. Very reminiscent of Malachi 3.10, Malachi 3.10, where it says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, talking about the treasury of the temple at that time. And he says, and therefore put me to the test, test me. If if you're faithful to me in your finances, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. You know, God blesses generosity. God blesses a giving heart. Where your treasure is, uh, there your heart will be also. One other psalm, and Dennis, you'll recognize this. I've heard him quote it, and 
that I, I, why I have it memorized in my mind. He says, I have been young uh, and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. And then he says, he is ever lending generously and his children become a blessing. Well, I, I've been young and now I'm older. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm old yet, but um, I've lived enough life and been privy enough to people and their finances enough to know that people that are generous people and giving people to the Lord's kingdom, God takes care of them. I've also lived long enough to see people that are struggling in that area, many times are struggling in the fact of giving to the Lord. And you, let me be clear, I'm not, you can't manipulate God. But, but God knows your heart. And he says, give back to me. Trust me, be a generous person. You know, only one exception to that, and I've experienced that, is I've, I've seen people struggle financially that were generous people, but just were not wise with their finances, spent their money on stupid stuff. I mean, that's the only, except, that's the only exception I've ever seen to somebody struggling financially who was generous. Without exception, every other time they haven't had struggles. God blesses generosity. Want a wise life, a happy life, be generous. And then maybe the most important, because it encompasses all the others, is a living and repenting life where you repent of your sin. Listen again to verses 11 and 12. It says, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Probably a better translation is, do not reject the Lord's discipline. Or be, be weary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves him whom he, whom he loves, as a father, the son in whom he delights. Want to live a wise life, a happy life? When the Holy Spirit convicts you, respond to that. When your conscience convicts you, re respond to that. Be a repenting person. That, that's how you know you're a believer, that you're his child. Because his Holy Spirit convicts you. He doesn't condemn you, that's the devil. But his Holy Spirit convicts you. Of your sin. The most unhappiest person in the world isn't an unbeliever. The most unhappiest person in the world is a believer who has sin in their life that they will not turn from. That's what repentance is. Repentance means I agree with you, God, about this, and I'm going to do my best to stop it. That's my definition of repentance. I agree with you, God, about this. I'm going to do a 180, repent, and I'm going to do my best to stop it. A wise life. Uh, is a repenting life. Uh, first thesis of Martin Luther's 95 Theses. He says this, When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said repent, he intended that to be the entire life of the believer. That is the truth. Colossians says, Just as you receive Christ, so walk in him. What does that mean? How do you receive Christ? How do you become a Christian? You become a Christian by repentance and faith. You agree with God that your sin is... Uh, kept you out of a relationship with God and deserving of the penalty of sin, and you turn and you put your faith in the cross of Christ. You repent and faith. Repentance and faith. It's the two legs of the Christianity. Repentance and faith. It's, it's a wise and, uh, thing to do to be living a life of repentance. One last thing. I'll just close with this. We'll do one song uh, afterwards, but I, I was uh, introduced to, as many of you have, chat GPT this past week by my kids as they were visiting. So I, uh, I typed in the question, how do you live a wise and happy life? So this was AI's answer. Living wisely and happily often involves finding balance in your life. Prioritize meaningful relationships. Practice gratitude, engage in activities and enjoy, and maintain a healthy lifestyle. Continuous learning and self-reflection can also contribute to wisdom. Embrace challenges as opportunities for growth and focus on what you can control. Cultivate mindfulness and living in the present moment can also enhance your overall well-being. Not a horrible answer, but I like mine better. Obedience. I like Solomon's better. Loving kindness, trust, fear, giving, repenting. That's how you live a wise 
a happy life. Let's pray. The bands will come and lead us one last song here. <clears throat> Father, I do pray just that, that you would help me and each person in here to live a life of wisdom, a life that lives for you, a life that loves you, a life that makes a difference for you. So, Father, I just pray that we would be obedient to your word. I pray just that verse again that came up, I think, by your will this morning. I pray that you would help me and each person to trust in the Lord with all of our heart. I pray for myself and each person that we would lean not on our own understanding of things. I pray for myself and each person that in all of our ways we would acknowledge you. And I pray for myself and each person that you would make our path straight. Make your will known to us. And so we give you our lives. We give you everything this morning. We pray together in Jesus' name. Amen. Somebody told me um, this week that they said that the, they think one of the most important times on Sunday, yeah, stand up, sorry. <laughs> sorry for the confusion. One of the most important times, they said, in Sunday morning service, um, and I thought this was really insightful, was, was the time directly <laughs> after the message was a time of response. And why that's so important is that's when it's turned over to each of our hearts, right? This is the part where you're responsible for, or each where I'm responsible for. We've, we've heard this message now. We've heard this truth and Brent presented it so well. And, and now you and I have a chance to be convicted by this and to change it, change, change, be changed from it. Um, so <clears throat> Jason, can you put that last, that, that list there Brent had of all the, the words there? Yeah. So just to, as we kind of go into this time, I just want to leave that list up there for just a minute or two and let you read it. <laughs> and we'll read it, we'll just read it here in silence and maybe the Lord has been speaking to you about something here this morning, something to, to be thinking about over the upcoming year. But why don't we just take this time as a response time, let the Lord speak to you and maybe it's time, it is time to repent, maybe it's time to turn. Uh, maybe he's been speaking to you about that. So let's just take a moment here for that. <clears throat> 